Tonight, we are very honored to be uh, hosting Professor Jonathan Marks, who is also the Chair of Politics at International Relations at Ursinus College. He has published on modern and contemporary political philosophy in journals like the American Political Science Review, the Journal of Politics, the Journal of American Political Science, and the Review of Politics. He's the author of Let's Be Reasonable, <clears throat> a conservative case for liberal education, which is, we just came out recently, and uh, we'll have much to say about that book uh, ev eventually. And Perfection and Disharmony in the Thought of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. He co-edited and contributed to Principle and Prudence in Western Political Thought. He also has written on higher education for Insider Higher Ed, The Chronicle of Higher Education, The Weekly Standard, and The Wall Street Journal. He's a contributor to the, to the Commentary Magazine blog. So without further ado, please help me welcome Jonathan Marks to the podium. Good evening. Uh, thank you all for coming. I know there are some students here um, who have been subjected to my work, so I hope I can talk to some of them uh, after the talk, see what they thought. Hope we'll get some questions. I want to thank Anwar. I want to thank uh, Lucille, Neil, others who have put this event together. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to be hosted by the Center for Global Humanities. You've got a good thing going here, I think. It's also a pleasure to bring a little bit of Ursinus College, that's where I'm from, to the University of New England. I admit I've given our mascot an unfair advantage. Uh, we play fair at Ursinus, uh, but not me. My, my, my topic is Conservatives on the Quad. It's part of a broader project. I, I couldn't resist including one sentence from an adoring reviewer, but why think about conservatives in higher education at all. For one thing, at the risk of conflating Republicans and conservatives, Republican views of higher education long less positive than those of Democrats have plunged dramatically in recent years. At the beginning of the 2015 school year, that may seem like forever ago, but it wasn't that long ago, most Republicans thought that universities had a positive effect on the country. Now, not so much. Just as the college age population is poised to drop off a cliff in some regions, threatening the very existence of some colleges and the health of many others, it seems reasonable to ask, why don't Republicans like us? Let two recent stories start us out. Here's one. In Constructing Campus Craziness, good title, Donald Moynihan, Georgetown, political science tells how a few lines in a professor's syllabus ripped out of context, made their way from a Facebook post to college fix your daily dose of right-minded news, from there to a Wisconsin legislator who wrote, published, and shared a letter accusing the professor of hyper-partisanship over to Breitbart with over five million followers on Facebook to the even more popular Fox News and the king himself, Tucker Carlson, who declared that all the dumb kids wind up teaching at the University of Wisconsin. The ensuing storm caused the university to take down the professor's contact information and the professor who received death threats to delete his Facebook account itself a kind of social death. Why are universities so unpopular with Republicans? Because of a propaganda campaign carried out by conservative media and conservative politicians. Another self-flattering way of putting this, we're unpopular because we're so darned good. Conservatives want to shut down universities because they can't handle the truth. But here's another story, also out of the University of Wisconsin, for the sake of symmetry. They used to have this big rock on campus, Chamberlain Rock, 12 feet tall, maybe 2 billion years old, 
the kind of rock that makes a sober geologist smile. But someone discovered that about 100 years ago, a new story referred to this big rock, and the story used a term then in use for large, dark rocks, which contained the most powerful racial insult in our language. That was enough for activists to demand that this 42-ton rock be shattered or maybe buried because it was doing harm. Never mind that this move from a century-old newspaper reference to present-day harm is akin to refusing to drive in big luxury cars because some people used to call them Jew canoes or yanking out the corrugated nails from your home because they were once called Jew nails. Crooked, you see. What makes this story isn't what activists did. Folks do all kinds of things, and making unreasonable demands is hardly the worst of them. What is newsworthy is that administrators all the way up to the University of Wisconsin's flagship university chancellor adopted the view that the rock was contaminated and spent tens of thousands of dollars removing it. So, why are colleges unpopular with Republicans? Because they've been captured by left-wing fanatics. Now, on the first view, what we've got is a public relations problem where we need either mildly to tell our story better or less mildly to fight back against our right-wing enemies. On the second view, we have an internal problem to which we should attend. You may recognize here an echo of the broader debate over education, including K through 12, in which one side, hair on fire, worries that the far left is eating their children, while the other side, hair on fire, shouts the very idea that educators are anything other than unbiased. Truth tellers is a conservative fever dream. So I'll proceed this way. First, I'll deal with a conservative worry about higher education. And I'll say why I think that non-conservatives should worry too. That's the longest part, so be patient. If it looks like I'm halfway through the talk and I'm still in part one, that's just because it's the longer part. Second, I'm going to say why I think conservative worries are exaggerated. Third, I'm going to offer an account of and justification for higher education that I think, for liberal education, that I think conservatives of different types should be able to buy and that non-conservatives should also consider purchasing. So part one, a conservative worry. Well, the worry is that universities are left liberal enemy strongholds. There's long been a part of the university that considers it a vehicle for progressive or radical action. The Port Huron Statement, 1962, a founding document of American student activism envisions universities, and I'm quoting, as bases for an assault on the loci of power. From its schools and colleges across the nation, it says, a militant left might awaken its allies. Sunaina Myra, an activist for the Boycott Israel movement, echoed that language not long ago when she said that the academic wing of the boycott movement is part of larger efforts by scholars to transform the university into a site of struggle to challenge US imperial power and its proxies. Does this part of the university run the show? No, hardly. But there are more scholars who put themselves on the far left than there were 30 years ago and fewer conservatives. In the late 1980s to mid-1990s, self-identifying far leftists, they're in green, were around 5.5% of four-year college faculty, according to the Higher Education Research Institute faculty survey. Conservatives in yellow greatly outnumbered them, roughly three to one. In 2016-17, the most recent survey available, far leftists are now 11.5% of the faculty, they've doubled. And watch those lines meet, conservatives barely outnumber them at 11.7%. I suspect strongly the far left identifiers will outnumber plain old conservatives in the next run of this survey. Now we shouldn't conflate numbers with influence. Professors of a far left persuasion often sit in departments that are on the chopping block when colleges chop. But I do think with other commentators that they have a disproportionate influence and speculate that there are a couple of reasons for this. 
First, I assume the professors on the far left are more likely than others to think of themselves as scholar activists. So they're more inclined to care about pushing campus in their favored political direction and more likely to be organized than their colleagues. The conservatives in the School of Agriculture are probably not looking up from their biofuel crops to either ramparts, and most professors probably prefer not to practice politics. A small number of persistent and determined people beats an unorganized group without specific aims most days of the week, especially if most members of that group are conflict averse and eager to get back to their labs. A second reason that self-identified far-left professors may have more influence than their numbers suggest is that the number of self-identified liberals there in brown there on campus has also grown. In the late 80s to mid-1990s, if you put together self-identified moderates, they're in gray, conservatives and far-rightists, virtually non-existent, in blue, they outnumbered the far-left liberal contingent around 55% to 45% today. It's the other way around. The far-left liberal contingent outnumbers all the rest of the groups, including moderates, 60% to 40%. So maybe the liberals liked President Obama, rather than viewing him as a neoliberal, drone-bombing, lobbyist-loving, race-de-emphasizing part of the problem, but liberals, the largest group on campus by far, may find themselves broadly in sympathy with the goals of their colleagues in the far left, even if they fret about excesses. The same may be true of student-facing administrators, who a survey by the political scientist Sam Abrams suggests are more liberal than the faculty. Student affairs professionals surveyed by Abrams, among them, the ratio of liberals to conservatives is 12 to 1. 29% of his respondents identified as very liberal, 42% liberal, 6% conservative. So Abrams' sample, and you'd want to scale up this study to be confident, justifies his suggestion that a fairly liberal student body is being taught by a very liberal professoriate and socialized by an incredibly liberal group of administrators. How is faculty partisan orientation related to student partisan orientation? Here's some student data, again, from the Higher Education Research Institute. You see an uptick in, in liberals. They're still brown, far left, still green, right? Those identifiers are going up. But you see also that conservatives, yellow, hold close to steady, and middle of the rotors, gray, remain a plurality. Faculty trends don't just mirror student ones. And you can see this when Sam Abrams puts student, faculty, and general population data together. Um, on the next slide, this is showing the ratio of liberals to conservatives in each group. Faculty is the dashed line. And it shows how it changes over time. Now, I am not a professional data analyst, but I think I spot a trend, right, um, which is a growth in the ratio of liberals to conservatives among faculty that is not matched, right, in the other two populations under consideration here. So this is not just something that's going on in the whole country that's affecting faculty too. It seems to be something faculty specific. Now this may seem obvious to some of you, but skepticism about whether colleges and universities are really left-leaning abounds. Um, so I want to address that. Skeptics point to the politics of the American professoriate survey. This was fielded a long time ago, which tells you something already, 2006, by Neil Gross and Solomon Simmons. And that survey did find that how tilted things seem depend on how you ask your questions and how you slice your data. The Harry survey gives us five categories, far left, liberal, middle, conservative, far right. But what if we went to a seven point scale? then collapse those who considered themselves only slightly something or another into the moderate camp. Then moderates outnumber liberals, 46% to 44%. And that's not just tricks they're playing with categories and charts. Gross and Simmons surveyed their sample on issues and found some warrant for putting those slightlies into the moderate camp. So a lot of people point to that survey and say, well, the whole thing's made up. It's a right-wing myth. There is no left liberal lean on college campuses. But the Gross-Simmons study was directed only against exaggerations of that lean. A couple of observations. 
First, when you fold your slightly conservatives into the moderates, you eliminate more than half of your conservatives. Most conservatives in the Gross-Simmons survey were only slightly conservative. So although Gross and Simmons make academia look somewhat less liberal than others did, they also make it look even less conservative than others did. And they jack up the ratio, actually, of liberals to conservatives from less than four to one, which is about where the Harry data was at that time, to five to one. Second and related, when you take the slightlys out of that liberal camp, that liberal camp is now very liberal. 1.4 on a five point scale with one being as liberal as you can be on the issue questions Gross and Simmons used. In contrast, those who consider themselves slightly conservative in academia are measured by these issue questions just a hair to the left of center. And the conservatives who remain in the conservative camp are not nearly as far to the right of center as liberals are to the left of it. And I'll show you this slide again. Remember, the Gross-Simmons survey is fielded in 2006. That's right around when you see this big leap, right, after 2006 in the ratio of liberals to conservatives. So I'm quite sure if the survey were fielded this year, it would look a lot different. Even had it been fielded in 2010, it would have looked a lot different than it did in 2006. Gross and Simmons also give the lie to something one often hears in discussions of political diversity on campus. Some people will say, well, sure, some departments are lopsided, but what about super conservative departments like business? Well, guess what? Gross Simmons, by far the study most favorable to that kind of claim, found that, yeah, conservatives did outnumber liberals a bit among business professors, 25% to 21%, but that's not that far from a one-to-one -one ratio. In the social sciences, in contrast, the liberal to conservative ratio was 11 to one. and the humanities, it was 13 to one. So there's no comparison here. In fact, it seems that economics is an exception. In departments in which politics is most likely to be discussed, faculty are actually more left-leaning than they are in other departments. Neil Gross is actually quite clear about what the Gross-Simmons survey meant. And it's not what people say it means. These quotations, and it's worth taking a moment to look at them, are from his book, Why Are Professors Liberal and Why Do Conservatives Care? Conservatives often portray the academy as a bastion of liberalism. They are essentially correct. Yeah, I'm not going to read them all. But Gross and Simmons do set out to dispel some right-wing myths, but that colleges are really, really ideologically lopsided is not one of the myths that they set out to dispel. So conservatives complain about the strong left liberal lean of faculty, and all the evidence we have suggests they're right about the existence of that lean, why it's there, and whether it promotes bias, we can leave for later. Meanwhile, administrators, as conservatives see them, have not been wary about jumping into progressive politics. Part of this venture is internal carried out through administrative units focusing on equity and inclusion and baked increasingly into the hiring process where candidates craft statements demonstrating their commitment in these areas. One should, one advice column explains, focus on the most widely accepted meaning of those terms, diversity, inclusion, so don't write about your experience advising evangelicals on your secular campus, but write instead about racial oppression, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, and some other commonly recognized forms of oppression. That's from the advice column. And if possible, your activism in connection with those matters. This may or may not be the way of judging job candidates, but that it's rooted in progressive commitment seems clear enough. The University of Hartford requires a statement in which candidates are urged, among other things, to provide examples of their own anti-racist values and actions. That statement, according to Hartford's job ads, will be evaluated before any other element of the application. So before they look at your resume, they want to see what that little essay looks like. I'm not saying that fit with mission should be irrelevant to evaluating candidates, though I do think the colleges and universities should want gadflies around who question their premises. So I think the screening that Hartford is using is indefensible. What I am suggesting is that diversity statements, which are quite common now, can be ideological tests. After all, approaches to inequality are politically coded. 
Maybe I've written a paper supporting Orlando Patterson's attempt to revive culturalist approaches to poverty. Patterson is not a self-described conservative, but cultural explanations for poverty are now coded conservative. Or maybe I've written a paper supporting John McWhorter's view that contemporary anti-racism is on balance counterproductive. McWhorter is not a self-described conservative, but criticisms of contemporary anti-racism are mostly coded that way. I doubt that a Marxist like Adolf Reed would pass through Hartford's screen applied as written either. Would I encourage candidates to include such papers in their diversity statement on the grounds that they reflect defensible approaches to the matter? Hell no, because while I can imagine a way of handling diversity statements so that they don't screen out dissent from and screen in assent to the views of the left liberal majority, they seem likely to do exactly that. If you're a top flight economist who thinks that structural racism is not the best lens through which to understand inequality and you write that in your diversity statement, chances seem pretty good that thanks, next, is what you're going to get out of that. Administrators also venture into politics in outward facing ways. Consider Michael Roth, the president of Wesleyan University, who last June called for higher education to be anti-fascist, by which he seemed to mean join the struggle against Donald Trump and the forces behind him. Now, as an evolutionary biologist specializing in salamanders, nothing against evolutionary biologists specializing in salamanders, my sister is one, uh, you may think that in your capacity as a scholar, what you do when you take off your scholar's cap is another thing entirely, but in your capacity as a scholar, you should be apolitical, or at least not speak as a scholar about matters in which you have no more expertise than your neighbor, Peter Griffin. But think again, Roth suggests, the posture, and note the sneer in that description. The posture of the apolitical is a posture of complicity. Let's grant that there's something off-putting about people, including university people, standing aloof from consequential matters on which people's well-being depends. But this aloofness has to do with the character of the university as an institution. Would Roth tell a federal judge whose code of conduct forbids her from engaging in political activity? My wife clerks for a federal judge, and even as a clerk, you can't put a political sign on your lawn. Would Roth tell such a judge that the posture of the apolitical is a posture of complicity? It seems perverse to treat as objectively pro-fascist the claim that there are spheres and institutions, the rule of law and the federal judiciary, the life of the mind and the university that should maintain their distance from politics even when politics is pressing. Yet many higher education leaders gravitate toward Roth's position, whether out of conviction or self-interest. So, a politically lopsided university in which the far left has an outsized influence particularly when that university scoffs at worries about politicization, deeming them objectively racist and fascist dithering, has been an object of conservative attention. Let me now say why, even if that lopsidedness has to do with a pipeline, there just aren't as many conservatives who are interested in getting PhDs, which seems to be true, as there are liberals, it should nonetheless be an object not just of conservative attention, but of nearly everyone's attention. First, and this is brief, but, but, but important, partisan bias is hard to overcome. In matters that touch on politics directly or indirectly, our partisanship may influence which subjects we think are most urgent, which books we think it's good to read, which speakers we want to invite, which research conclusions we view with skepticism, which students we view as pests at whom to throw the conduct code, and which we hail as heroes, and even which views we're most inclined to challenge in the classroom. Over 80% of faculty surveyed by the Higher Education Research Institute agree, at least somewhat, that it's their goal to encourage students to become agents of social change. All right, what kind? Let me add that while direct evidence of discrimination against conservatives is lacking, there is some concerning willingness to discriminate, especially on hiring. That's the very last column of the last couple of columns of this rather 
complicated graph, on the basis of ideology. Liberals and conservatives are about equally likely to say explicitly, yeah, among equally qualified candidates, I'd pick the candidate who shares my political ideology. This is, note, a measure of explicit, right? Not implicit bias. These are people who are asked and saying, yeah, I discriminate. Around a third, right, of conservative faculty and around a third of a liberal faculty say, yeah, we do that. Um, so they're about equally willing to discriminate, but there are a lot more liberals, as we've seen, than there are conservatives on campus. I don't want to make too much of this study, which though it replicates in other studies, itself small, but it's suggestive. If we think in other areas that implicit bias might be playing a key role in people's actions, then why discount this evidence of non-trivial, 30%, non-trivial explicit bias? More broadly, shouldn't we expect, just because we're only human, even college professors, that even when we have pretty good professional safeguards, which I think we do, we're likely to be biased and to think that we aren't. Likely to be biased and to think that we're not, especially when we're surrounded by people who share our ideological orientation. Second, the case for academic freedom has long rested on the idea that the university is a nonpartisan institution of learning. That's from the 1915 American Association of University Professors Declaration on academic freedom and tenure. The more we decide that it's appropriate, even necessary, for universities to promote a particular vision of social justice, the more it makes perfect sense, perfect sense, for legislators to say, well, you know, if there's a politics here, I'd rather have it be mine than yours. It makes perfect sense, perfect sense, for trustees to say, if there's going to be a politics here, I'd rather it be mine than yours. That is indeed what Republican state legislators are saying right now in bill after terrible bill. Some already passed targeting education, including for some of them higher education. Will people who have been openly clamoring to turn the university into a base for an assault on the low side of power say back, how dare you legislators politicize education? It would be more honest to say, I reckon you've got us. Part two, why conservative, worries, why conservative worries are exaggerated. Whether because professional safeguards still matter at universities, which I think they do, or because much of university life is not politicized, I think that's true too, or because conservatives still constitute 12% of faculty, which isn't nothing, um, it's not that bad on average for conservatives at universities. I'll look at two areas of concern. Concern one, conservatives are persecuted on our campuses. Indeed, as the conservative critic Heather McDonald puts it, we are in a free speech totalitarian crisis. Earlier this year, we heard from a Princeton student writing in the Conservative National Review that even mild-mannered anti-Trump George Will, he of the bow tie, was deemed too controversial to be invited to campus by a Princeton debating society. Stalin lives at Princeton, declared one conservative I've worked with. Conservatives have, in effect, been exorcised from academic settings, declared the student. Now, in fact, this debating society, the American Whig Cleosophic Society, fancy school, fancy name, is organized to encourage debate between conservatives and liberals. Months before the Will incident, they had Ted Cruz to visit. Not long before that, they had Ken Buck, of Colorado, who had not long before his invitation made news for a video in which brandishing his AR-15 semi-automatic, he dared Joe Biden and Beto O'Rourke to try to take it from him. He got an invitation. Setting aside Wig Cleo, George Will himself was baccalaureate speaker at Princeton in 2019. A book on free speech by a conservative, Keith Whittington, was assigned to and made a focus of discussion for the class of 2022 and Princeton is the home of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions, which regularly brings in conservative speakers and visiting fellows. Robert George, who founded it, says that Princeton is a good place for conservative students. In short, sure, there's plenty for conservatives to complain about at Princeton. You know, if somebody paid for an exorcism there, they should ask for their money back. That's one story. 
but I think it's representative. So yes, same, Sam Abrams, I already mentioned him, at Sarah Lawrence University, faced calls to have his tenure revisited over his public criticism of Sarah Lawrence's diversity and inclusion programming. And although Sarah Lawrence is among the most liberal campuses in the country, Abrams's case is not unique. Yet Abrams, without denying any trends that distress conservatives, also notes that conservative and liberal job satisfaction in academia is about the same, even a little bit higher for conservatives. Abrams's picture of universities is not as hostile to conservatives as one might imagine. It's consistent with the findings of Joshua Dunn and John Shields, whose book Passing on the Right, 2017, is based on interviews and a survey of a sample of conservative professors. Uh, they found um, that the respondents generally told us that the academy is far more tolerant of right-wing critics, I'm sorry, far more tolerant than right-wing critics of the progressive universities seem to imagine. Um, sure, they say they face discrimination of various kinds, but the on-balance message is, right, that the university is more tolerant than right-wing critics tend to imagine. Concern two, conservative students are compelled to self-censor on their left liberal campuses. Now there's definitely, I think, something to that. And I've heard as much from conservative students and a few liberal students in my own college with the liberal students saying, yes, I've noticed that conservative students have a hard time thinking up. Multiple surveys find that many students are reluctant to speak up about controversial matters and that conservatives and Republicans are more reluctant to speak up about such matters than their liberal and democratic counterparts by far. On the other hand, consider the 2019 Heterodox Academy Campus Free Expression Survey. 2019, seems like a long time ago, but not exactly a quiet political year. How many conservatives said they were very reluctant to speak up about race and class? I just want you to put a number into your head. 7.7%. If we're in the midst of a free speech totalitarian crisis, that figure would be closer to a gazillion percent than to 8%. Now, a few caveats. First, the same survey somewhat altered found more self-censorship in 2020. No information was provided about conservatives, but the percentage of Republicans very reluctant to speak doubled. Second, a 2021 survey conducted by the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, FIRE is their nifty acronym, uh, they surveyed 150 high-ranked schools and about a third of Republican students, now that's getting non-trivial, about a third very reluctant to discuss controversial political topics compared to just 10% of strong Democrats saying the same. Third, self-censorship surely varies from campus to campus. I worry about a place like Amherst College where fewer than 10% of students in the FIRE survey report feeling very comfortable discussing controversial political topics. So I don't think that the data that we've got screams crisis, and I think we should be careful about interpreting data about partisan self-censorship differences when the extent to which colleges compel students to self-censor is itself a partisan issue, which might be affecting the way people answer these surveys. Nonetheless, it seems to me that campuses, which for the most part show little inclination to engage with findings regarding self-censorship, ought to be conducting their own surveys and focused groups to try to understand what's going on. The University of North Carolina did that recently and found out some interesting stuff. Who cares about whether the atmosphere at universities is just kind of bad or very bad for conservatives on campus? I think it determines what one thinks can be done. Increasingly, conservatives are following the lead of the classicist Victor Davis Hanson, who speaks of outlaw campuses and looks forward to a day when the humanities will not be delivered at places like this, but uh, maybe through DVDs. That's conservative, right? Um, he looks forward to a time when universities will be more vocational, right? Because he thinks that campuses have become so left liberal that the whole enterprise is doomed. Or the conservative commentator Roger Kimball, who says that universities are dedicated to the destruction of truth and the highest values of our civilization and urges us to refuse to subsidize the perversion they're peddling. They follow that lead rather than the lead of Robert George, whom I've already mentioned, who says it takes maybe five people to make a big difference on campus. That is, the difference between sort of bad or very bad is the difference between treating the university 
as an enemy asset to be weakened or destroyed and treating it as an institution at which conservatives have a stake and might do some good. All right, part three. What might be a worthy conservative aim for universities? It depends on what kind of conservative one is talking about. But until yesterday, many conservatives taking the American founding to be worth conserving and understanding it as distinguished by its openness to independence on reason might have said with the political theorist Alan Bloom, who wrote the best-selling and influential work, The Closing of the American Mind, that colleges and universities are homes of reason. One advantage of this aim is that colleges and universities claim to embrace it already. Critical thinking at least sometimes makes it onto the lists of core values that we, aping corporations more and more, are generating at a high rate. But reasonable people are not merely possessors of a box of critical thinking tools, which shills, hyperpartisans, and BS artists often possess too, and often use with frustrating skill. Reasonable people say to themselves with the 17th century political and educational theorist John Locke that there cannot be anything so misbecoming, anyone who pretends to be a rational creature as not to yield to plain reason and the conviction of clear arguments. They consider reason an authority rather than a tool with which to get the better of others. When we say with a hint of frustration sometimes, let's be reasonable, we don't mean let's review what we learned in Logic 101, but rather let's stop fooling around or puffing ourselves up or boosting our tribes and instead consider as if it really mattered what conclusions, if any, we can draw from what we know. This plea reflects our sense of the difference between the person Locke calls a logical chicaner, a skilled debater, and the person Locke calls the man of reason who seeks to improve his understanding. These are the two most different things in the world, Locke says. But the difference isn't notably on anybody's agenda. To adopt the shaping of reasonable people in this sense as an aim for liberal education is to confront a problem as evident in Locke's 17th century as it is now. Even those whose intelligence and capacity to detect prejudice in others cannot be doubted pick at the prejudices that mislead other men or parties as if they had none of their own. It is rare that anyone can be brought fairly, I'm still quoting Locke here, to examine his own principles. A person undisposed to question prejudices imbibed from education, party, reverence, fashion, interest, prejudices derived from miscellaneous sources, neither chosen nor understood by him, isn't free and is protected only by good fortune, a happy fit between prejudice and circumstance from making dangerous mistakes. The learned are not immune from failing to notice that the grounds on which their reasoning rests reflects their narrow experience. Liberal education seeks to correct this narrowness. We see but in part, we know but in part, and therefore it is no wonder that we conclude not right from our partial views. The comprehensive enlargement of mind, that's what Locke calls it, that's another way of thinking of liberal education's aim, entails listening closely to the opposite arguings of talented people showing the different sides of things, and listening closely too to those we think come short of us in capacity. Their experience may correct ours. It entails recognizing the limits of the science that we study, the books that we read, the ways of knowing and modes of analysis with which we're comfortable and in which we've been trained. It entails the study of old books as well as new ones, since part of our narrowness is the narrowness of time. It entails travel if one can manage it, because part of our narrowness is the narrowness of place. Here, many of the elements of what we think of as liberal arts education emerge from reflection on how one might overcome some of the many obstacles to being reasonable. I've already said that universities are in the critical thinking business. They're also in the reason business in this wider sense. There is still some dishonor attached here for clinging zealously to a dear argument in the face of overwhelming evidence against it, to being dogmatic, to propagandizing. All these are violations of what's called scientific conscience in the 1915 declaration I referred to before. The warning in that same document that the unparalleled freedom of scholars to set forth their conclusions rests 
on there being conclusions gained by a scholar's method and held in a scholar's spirit is a specialized version of the idea that the university is a community of people who are supposed to follow the evidence and arguments where they lead and to share at least provisional standards for evaluating evidence and arguments, even in matters that can't be definitively settled. In appealing to that idea, the conservative is not appealing to something foreign to university people. For this reason, among others, and despite the long pedigree of a conservatism that appeals to Locke, one might doubt that I'm even making out a conservative case for liberal education. This reasonable person seems suspicious of unchosen obligations and ties to one's ancestors, one's children, one's children's children, to one's home, broadly conceived, that gives most lives meaning. On that view, our locky and reasonable person, listening to opposing arguments, attending to the experience of others, reading different books, investigating different approaches, leads a life that sounds good to fancy intellectuals, to put a populist spin on this argument, but bears no relation to the lives most people live or wish to live. There are conservatives for whom Locke is a villain. Let's call these anti-liberal conservatives to distinguish them from conservatives. Let's call them liberal conservatives for whom Locke is something of a hero. Anti-liberal conservatism is indeed not compatible with liberal education as I've been describing it, yet I think even for the anti-liberal conservative, it is a mistake to pray for the university's demise. After all, Patrick Deneen's Why Liberalism Failed, a work very much in the anti-liberal spirit, proposes that liberalism, while it may eventually sink under its own weight, is today entirely pervasive and triumphant, constituting a cave so dark and deep that alternatives to it cannot be imagined. Deneen himself is compelled to turn to Locke and others to try to reconstruct a political philosophy too dominant otherwise to get one's head around to get outside of it and look and see what it is. And he turns to Greek and Roman authors to find rival philosophies. That is, Deneen turns to texts that are mainly read where? At our colleges and universities. Contrary to reports of the demise of such books, they rank very high on the Open Syllabus Project's list of books we assign to students. If colleges and universities were to practice liberal education as the shaping of reasonable people, it would still be more true for the, for the illiberal conservative that in an ocean of progressivism, the university would be one of few islands in which one might reflect on alternatives. Even when liberal education is understood as the shaping of reasonable people, it is not, as the illiberal argument suggests, merely or primarily for the training up of intellectuals. For Locke, whose education is directed toward people of the world, one pursues enlargement of mind to whatever extent opportunity affords because the understanding is the last resort a person, whether a scholar, a laborer, or both, has recourse to in the conduct of himself in every important matter. This proposition is not straightforward or uncontroversial, but it suggests that liberal education serves a permanent need, not a party. <laughs>